had 24 new patient referrals on the fax line sometime at the end of last week. And I had to keep asking my my admin person, I'm like, are you sure? Like, is this for real? What's like, we normally get, you know, one week we'll get five, one week we'll get 10, and probably not much more than that, 24 in one day. Apparently what had happened was there's a um, Medicaid clinic down the road that I'm have, I have a hunch, one of their primary like referral uh, places said, we're not taking these referrals anymore. So now all of a sudden they had nowhere to send these referrals and we, we accept Medicaid. So we were on the list. We would usually get one or two a week from them. All of a sudden we got 24 like in a day, but here's the problem. We don't serve the population, uh, those conditions. Like it's primarily low back pain. I don't, nobody in my clinic wants to treat low back pain. It's, you know, persistent pain, chronic pain issues. There's multiple complexities. There's all these other overlaying, obviously, so socioeconomic factors, um, lots of anxiety, lots of other things that we just can't treat well. In fact, I had a conversation with a patient. You're, you're, you'll probably crack up at this. Um, as soon as I got on the phone with this individual, I could hear the anxiety. I could hear the personality through the voice. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna say it like that. And then I was like, well, "What's your condition? What are, What are you looking to to resolve?" And she was like, uh, "They told me it's SI joint." I'm like, oh, "I'm sorry. We we just don't do a good job with SI joint." If I had a, and this is what I, this is exactly what I told her. If I had a family member who had an SI joint problem, I would not send them to this clinic because you and she had told me this previous want manual therapy while we do offer manual therapy we do not have the kind of therapists that provide the manual therapy that you are looking for for si joint i said call athletico i know the staff there they have a couple great manual certified physical therapists they will be a better option for you now i can do that because i know that i have plenty of referrals coming in. I know that I've got deep roots. I know that nobody is going to, you know, stop referring to me because I said that. And, and I genuinely with all of my heart believe it is in that patient's best interest to go to somewhere else. Could I force myself to deliver an SI joint treatment? Yes. Could I even force myself to do manual therapy for an SI joint? Yes, I could but I don't want to. I'm not at that stage in my career or my business that I need to. Um, so you're back. Let's see how your stream is going. Before you got off, I said, yeah, I want to hear you're right. It drains the staff. It, it kills the culture. Other, you, you then become a commoditized physical therapy service, which I've talked about before. But what are you thinking? So one thing I was thinking when you posted, maybe, like I said, in the past couple of years, you posted something like, no one wants to go to physical therapy. And I was kind of, it kind of dawned on me. I was kind of like, well, well, first of all, like, I I think I read that originally as like, I didn't agree or it's negative, but then I was like, actually, yeah, it makes sense because like no one plans an injury. No one plans like they, you know, tweak themselves, they tweak their back, you know, picking a box out of, you know, out of the trunk of their car or they slip on ice and fall or, or a sports injury. Like one, you know, my weekend baseball buddies, like, you know, men's, hardball league like no one plans to tweak their knee strain their calf their hamstring have shoulder pain whatever like no one plans that of course um so i do agree with it but then there is a let's say a a continuum of different types of patients and therapy offerings out there and i think the the biggest stark reality uh of it being a grudge is, is I think kind of tailing back into like a third party payer. So you mentioned already like workers comp or no fault or, um, you know, kind of some of the, uh, some of the plans where they have to, you know, quote unquote, fail physical therapy before they get approved for an MRI or whatever. So that's because of the payer, because of an insurance, usually it's not, it's not a physician saying, well, sometimes, sometimes it might be, but the physician depends on the medical model but typically it's because of the payer, right? Is why sometimes some of these patients might look at physical therapy as a grudge purchase. However, uh, so we take some, we take a bunch of out-of-network insurances, 
Um, but they're usually paying something on the front end anyway to hit their deductible, even now in, you know, May of this year, like some people still are hitting their deductibles. So for the most part, we're out of pocket, right? And there is a huge difference. If someone's going to pay 200 or, you know, somewhere else, 150, some in, in some other state or, or where other place, if someone's going to pay a hundred, 200, $300 per visit for physical therapy, those patients and clients are absolutely not looking at physical therapy or they're not looking at our offering as a grudge purchase. So I don't want to be up on a pedestal saying like my offering is better or because we don't accept any in-network insurances. I'm not saying my offering is better. I'm not saying that we're better in any way. But if there was some, you know, I don't know, Netflix documentary crew that was filming my 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 therapists and my patients or interviewing my patients and then doing a, a simultaneous interview of another clinic maybe like i don't know like tony's or some other place that ex accepts every insurance plan there will be a different perspective and our patients and clients are definitely not looking at our offering as a grudge purchase if anything our clientele they like to the, or they're, or they're framing it in their mind as like they're investing in their health and wellness or they're working on, you know, bettering themselves or whatever, but they are voluntarily ponying up the money, 200, 300, whatever per visit. And I've shared on other videos and things, not that it's a big deal, but people that spend thousands or tens of thousands of dollars with us over time. Uh, and it's interesting. I, I'm not saying I'm better. I'm just saying we're different. Um, take it how you want it. but it, I think it depends on either the clinic or the practice model or the insurance involvement. Let me throw it back to you, Tony. What do you, what do you think of some of that stuff? I think you're better. I think you're better at solving the problem that those individuals have 100%. Um, and, and so that's okay. It's good to be better. Like that's what we're all striving for. And when I'm looking at that, you know, like I was doing a little research this weekend. So I keep hearing in, on all of these podcasts that I listen to, they're, they're universal threads that sew all of these businesses together. And one of the universal threads is we should have started charging more from the beginning. We should have had a higher ticket item. We should have charged our clients more. We shouldn't have been, and, and this is everything from SaaS to service to products. Every single successful business owner says, once we raised our prices, we got out of this certain demographic into a new demographic. And, and typically what you see is, yes, there is the occasional person who, you know, pays $3,000 for something and they're full of complaints and they, they, you know, have this sense of entitlement. There are those people out there. But my experience has been, and, and it's confirmed by so many of these people across multiple businesses, that generally once you move up in price, once you move into a, a different demographic, it's almost like they become more grateful. The value of the individual dollar decreases. So if I've got $20 million in the bank, $1,000, you know, isn't quite as impactful as if I have $1,000 in the bank and I'm going to spend $100. So... I see that a lot. I hear that a lot and I understand that. But then we also have to stratis stratify these different services. What you're delivering to a person who's actively engaged in seeking you out is very different than what I'm delivering in some cases to a person who's got nothing better to do. And so they're just going to go to the therapy clinic. You know, what's on your schedule today? Uh, I'm going to go to physical therapy. Like th these are just completely different worlds. They're totally separate. Um, now my job as the owner is to one, develop a profitable model that I could deliver on the expectation. The expectation is not to have a premier service. We're not going to serve Starbucks to all of our clients in the clinic. I used to do that. That's not what we do now. I just need to deliver a service with nice, friendly people, that move the needle a little bit. So do you feel better leaving than you did coming in? Awesome. We did our job today. You know, can you, can you put on your pants a little bit better today than you did yesterday? Awesome. Did I teach you some new stuff? Did I deliver some peace of mind? That's kind of the business that I'm in. Um, and can I do it at 
a discount rate? Can I do it at what the insurance is going to pay while still paying my team above market average, while still not overwhelming my team with excessive productivity and still running a business that I, I enjoy running? You know, that that's the thing. So you and I, it's apples and oranges, but absolutely you are better because you have the solution to your client's problem. So I, I want to double click on that for a second. So it's kind of what if, if I'm hearing you correctly, the patient style, interest, demographic, whatever, and the practice, they, they need to match, right? So right. like your, your culture, your, what you guys offer and all that, that needs to match that patient or client that's calling in. Um, on the front end. And so whether it's the front desk person speaking to the prospective patient, making sure that they're the right fit, whatever, because if there's a mismatch, then the new patient would have a higher likelihood of having some dissatisfaction and therefore say, you know, PT doesn't work, physical therapy doesn't work, or it's terrible, or, and, and we've covered this a bunch, which is like, you can't, you said you can't imagine doing one-on-one -on -one physical therapy visits for an hour. And that's what we offer, right? So there could be a mismatch. A patient goes to a practice and they want the socialization. They want to see other people. They want, they, they like the energy and all these, all these uh, different bodies and different personalities and the clinicians, the clinicians and the patients, the patients talking to the patients um, and vice versa. And then also my type of clientele when they call us up and they're like, yeah, I went to, I'm not going to say a name. I went to whatever clinic and they're treating three or four patients an hour. And I don't want that. I want the one, you know, I want one-on-one -on -one attention. And then, so that's our clientele. That's our ideal target because that person will say, could have potentially said physical therapy, just blanket statement doesn't work but some consumers are able to realize that there's different offerings out there. So then they do find us, they call us and they're like, yes, I want in-home physical therapy. Oh, you guys do an hour visit. Amazing. Like that's what I'm looking for. But your clientele does not want what I offer. Right. We've said this before, but if, if there's a mismatch in that, then that can immediately, if that person perceives that that is the offering nationwide, or that just is what it is, that is the offering of physical therapy for outpatient or outpatient in the home, if that mismatch stands, then it immediately would be perceived as a grudge and the dissatisfaction word of mouth can trickle on for years in the community because someone says, oh, I tried total therapy solutions and they're, they're looking for one-on-one -on -one attention and manual therapy and you don't offer manual therapy or someone, you know, calls us and, and they say, you know, this place concierge pain relief is a ripoff. They charge too much or whatever. And we get, uh, you know, the bad word about that way. Right. So there's like a mismatch. And, and so that's also sometimes challenging Tony, because that's kind of on the own, it's on the onus of the healthcare consumer, right? The patient, they, they might get a referral or a prescription, like you said, then they also might be doing research online or Google. And like, unless we have an advertisement that gets in front of them about our ideal offering that, that, that matches them, there could be a mismatch, which also would result in there being a grudge purchase. Even if they're trying it for the, like one visit, there could yeah. be an issue there. There could be a mismatch, right? Absolutely. I mean, we, we, I asked the question every single time. So for the last couple of years, since the pandemic, I've been the only physical therapist in the business. So I do all of the evaluations for all new incoming patients. And I ask every single one of them, what are you expecting us to do today? What are you expecting from physical therapy? I always ask them if they've been to physical therapy somewhere else in the past. Um, most of the time, or a lot of the time they have, but they don't remember anything about it, which is shocking to me. But then I'm like, so what are you expecting? And none of them, at least my clients, none of them really have this vision of what they expect. Um, they don't know if they're going to come in to work out. They don't know if they're going to come in to lay on the table and get a massage. They don't know if they're coming in to just talk or they're coming in to, you know, receive some sort of invasive treatment. They have no idea what to expect coming in the door. Um, we do see a lot of patients that have been patients of ours before. We get a ton that come back every single year, multiple episodes a year for different conditions. But 
the new ones have no context. And this is where it goes to Jerry Durham's point. We have to understand the buyer psychology. We have to understand what they're looking for. Um, Jerry talks about, you know, framing the patient care experience. My, my admin person, we, we didn't have an admin person for a couple months. Now they're back. And so they're, they're local, right? My admin person is local. They speak the way all of my local residents speak. Um, it's like a Midwest Ohio town. So there's certain sayings and things like I came here saying soda and everybody here says pop. It seems like a little thing but it makes the client feel more comfortable. They understand that they're talking to a local. My admin person like knows everything about everybody in the community. It's still a relatively small town. Um, even to the point where my, my admin person was like, oh, I see that you live over on this street and you know, our Middletown clinic is closer to you. So maybe it'd be better for you to schedule there. And I know that this school lets out at this time. So maybe it'd be better you know, to schedule here so you don't hit any traffic. Like they know all that kind of stuff. It puts the client at ease. Then even coming into my clinic, my clinic is not modern looking. My clinic does not have beautiful amenities and like great colors on the wall and amazing carpets. But my theme of my clinic is very consistent with the theme of most of the individuals who are coming, you know, which is just like a relaxed Midwestern comfortable vibe, um, family atmosphere. And, and so could I invest in making it look like a Starbucks? Sure. But I don't think that necessarily makes my clientele feel more comfortable, feel like they're coming into, you know, their own living room. And, and so I try to account for all of that. And, and that's where I think a good versus great physical therapy experience and business, what, where that difference is, it's like, I own, I enjoy treating patients. I'm happy to treat patients, but I love crafting the patient care experience. That's what gets me really excited. How can I eliminate the friction? How can I make it super comfortable? How can I maintain enough profit that we can, you know, all live the lives we want to live, but at the same time, really just make an exceptional patient care experience. And so you're hearing this difference on the one side, I'm like, I'm totally fine seeing a patient who doesn't want to do physical therapy. But on the flip side, I'm like, I put all of my mental energy into crafting the perfect patient care experience to the point where they don't even realize how much time and focus I put into it. Um, but that's all part of business, you know, and, and I, I, I do want to talk about the different personality types on our side, on the business owner side, on the clinician side, because we've been talking about personality types on the patient side. But what do you think about what I just shared? Yeah. I mean, I, I love that. That reminds me, I love um, what you're bringing up about your particular aesthetic of your community and how it kind of matches the the clientele's perception or what they're expecting, or maybe their type of a living room or how they would set up a physical therapy office or gym or gym equipment or whatever. Um, another thing, as you mentioned that, the one thing that we can offer that maybe you don't want to offer or other practices don't offer in regards to making sure it's not a grudge purchase really quick is that so let's say we get we have a new patient new client and for just for easy sake let's say they uh have own, you know in network only so they're out of pocket so they're going to pay 250 bucks a visit they agree to that they understand the one thing that we do to make sure and and i don't really teach or coach my therapist because i know you wanted to kind of get into the therapist side i don't really teach or coach my therapist specifically this i mean we we talk about it um but it's not necessarily like an onboarding call is we want to curate the visit we, we want to help them achieve whatever they're like towards whatever their goals are which is usually there's always something they want to go to central park they want to go to the opera they want to travel like whatever it is there's always more goals the one thing that we do though that i think is unique to make sure that it's not a grudge purchase is that we will ask questions to make sure whatever we're going to deliver, there's no like overlap of something that they're already getting. And what I mean by that is our clients might have, let's say, let's say, you know, a client, fake client named John. Let's say John has a personal trainer already. And now he's got, I don't know, back pain and sciatica. Okay. Well, for that type of clientele, that type of client, 
we can do some therapeutic exercise during the visit and maybe some HEP, home exercise program, whatever, and maybe even have a phone call with the trainer and say, hey, let's, uh, you know, you guys, if you're still do, working with your trainer, work on these things or avoid this or whatever it might be. Um, but our physical therapy visits will be less mobility or, or less therapeutic exercise because they already have a trainer. And so it will probably be more behavior modification, more manual therapy. It's going to be more of the things that they're not getting elsewhere with the trainer. Um, or let's say they, that same type of, you know, client, John, John does not have a personal trainer, right? So now if that person really needs the movement and the mobility in the beginning, we'll say, okay, maybe the first couple of visits will be a little bit more manual therapy, but over time we want to increase your therapeutic exercise. We want to increase your mobility, your drills, your strengthening for all these reasons or whatever, because that client, John is not getting the exercise or the, the movement elsewhere in his life. Right? So our, uh, our offering will kind of adapt or morph depending on what that person needs. And if someone's 80 or 90 years old, like we need to do most of the visit to be standing or gait or balance or whatever. And if they have some tweak in their neck or whatever, maybe we'll do five or 10 minutes of manual therapy just to kind of ease their their discomfort with their neck pain, but we need to redirect it back to the main, main thing because they're not getting gait or balance or mobility from any other provider or any other offering or whatever. So does that make sense in terms of like rearranging the offering from your therapist side, depending on what the patient or client really needs to make sure. And we, we don't, we just do it because we believe that that's best, but then also it will result in this offering being less likely to be a grudge purchase. Yeah. Yeah. It, it makes total sense. When we were more cash based, we would be exactly the same way, you know, and our therapist would say like, they can't do manual therapy to themselves. So let's do the manual therapy in here. We know that that's a big component on why some of these patients are coming. Um, we used to think that's why all of them were coming until COVID proved us wrong, but you know, so, so you're, you have the freedom to customize the patient care experience based on what the payer wants. In your case, the payer is the patient, you know, in my right. case, the payer is the insurance company. So I'm customizing the patient care experience to within the guideline of insurance. And I think one of the things that not today, but we should talk about is how often physical therapists use bribes to get patients in the door, to get patients to comply. Um, sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not, you know, when I was doing insurance based therapy primarily, and I'm using manual therapy at the end of my treatment, because I know the patient won't come and they won't do the exercise unless I bribe them with manual therapy at the end. And I would always ask this question. I would be like, most of the home health therapists that I know, probably not the ones listening to this show, but of the 200 plus thousand, 300,000 PTs across the country, most of the home health part A therapists are not doing manual therapy. Why is it that all of a sudden a therapist in outpatient seeing the same patient who now has transportation outpatient does manual therapy? Because it's a bribe, because it's a way for us to give the patient what they want to make them feel good, make them feel special, make them feel important. Um, but I, I guarantee if I took a hundred home health therapists for the same condition, not a single one or maybe two wouldn't touch that patient compared to a hundred outpatient private practice therapists. There's a disconnect there that we need to discuss publicly. Um, and, and when you look at payers and payer guidelines, I think the payer also knows it's a bribe, you know, so they're looking for limitations on how far we're going to bribe that patient. Um, Love that being said, it. you said something that if I, if I remember what it is, oh, the other thing I think we should leave the, the people here is it's not bad for it to be a grudge purchase. There are lots of grudge purchases. All of us do every it's single day, every single year. You know, nobody insurance. wants to buy car insurance. You buy it begrudgingly. You buy it hoping you never have to use it, but you hate paying for it. None of us want to buy life insurance. Like none of us, there's, I don't want to go to the DMV to renew my license. Now, of course you can do it online, but there are so many things that we still do. And so if I'm looking at it as a business owner, I'm like, what's the one thing that I can get a patient to do that they don't want to do? that they're not going to overutilize, that they're going to pay top dollar for, 
um, that's kind of a good business, right? Because now they're forced to do it. I don't want to pay taxes. Taxes is a huge grudge purchase. I have to do it. I don't want to do it. I try to avoid doing it as much as possible, but I do it begrudgingly. Um, it's okay to have a business that's built on a necessity or a requirement. All of the compliance that we pay for grudge purchase. I don't want to pay for compliance. I don't want to pay for HIPAA privacy. I don't want to pay for any of that stuff. I do it because I have to, I do it because I know it's, it's best for my family, for me, whatever, but you know, it's, it's just something you have to do. So it's okay to go into that line of business. That being said, let's talk about personality types and what you see. And what got me thinking about this, I was reading posts as I do. And you know, you see people's personality in their Facebook comments, LinkedIn comments, things like that. You get a sense for who they are. And so one individual that stuck out to me, um, I was reading a couple of this person's posts and I was like, this person is just never going to be satisfied with being a physical therapy business owner. And it's it's simply because their personality, and I understand their personality, they want black and white. They want yes, no. They want to be comfortable knowing that this is the right decision and this is the wrong decision. And as a business owner, we never get that luxury, right? We, we have to be comfortable in those gray areas. We have to be comfortable with, I'm not sure if this is right or wrong, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Um, so like there are certain personality types that do really well as a business owner. There are certain personality types that do really well as a clinician treating patients. There are certain personality types that do really well as a manager. I would hate to be a manager because I don't want to be involved in oversight. I don't want to be involved in that middle between the owner and the worker. Um, I know my personality as a treating clinician. It's very similar to my personality as a business owner of a practice. I want to hear about you. What do you think your personality type is in those different situations? Oh, man. Uh, well, hey, we have seven people watching for the record. Seven people. If you guys want to leave a comment on the YouTube channel, leave it. I'll share it. But go ahead. Tell me about your personality yeah. type. Right. So a question and maybe we'll answer before the end of the live show. Uh, my personality around this, I, I, I agree. I'm not really the, I'm not typically the like black or white with a lot of decisions or situations around practice management or business or patients or whatever it might be. Um, as I think my comments or posts or whatever will kind of show like, and even my comments here is like, um, like even when we talked about today, there's a, there's a continuum. There's a, there's always going to be like a variation depending on the situation. Everything is kind of, it can be situational. It depends on what's going on. It depends on the patient in front of you. Um, I, I, I typically, I would say a little bit more open-minded, even, even things that you've posted in the past, like whether it's about physical therapy or practice management or business or patients or entrepreneurship or whatever. Um, I, I think that open-mindedness has allowed me to say my my immediate reaction typically for a lot of your posts will be like i disagree and here's why but then like it might be like a year later or two years later or something and then it's like oh yeah tony yeah he posted something about grudge purchases and now i i get it i didn't i didn't get it then i didn't understand it then and i said what I felt, which was like, for example, I disagreed on, you know, whatever, like grudge purchase or whatever. Um, but then after a year or two, either I matured or I learned, I got more data points. I learned more from different places. And then it hit me like, wow, it, physical therapy and many other businesses or offerings can be a grudge purchase. Like you said, car insurance, taxes, your accountant, you know, filing your taxes, uh, whatever it might be. Um, and so I think that that has allowed me to kind of, uh, navigate and, or a cell or, or, or ascend through the entrepreneurial life, um, because of my flexibility and my adaptiveness over time. And I think I, I, I agree with your example of the practice owner who everything needs to be kind of cut and dry black or white, it's this or that. And in, and in life or in managing patients, treating patients, managing therapists, your practice, whatever, 
um, it's not always binary. It, 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 there's there's like a gray area, uh, and it it depends, right? It, it it will it depends on the situation. We establish guidelines. We establish maybe a playbook, uh, some rules or whatever for different different uh, treatments. Uh, how to onboard therapists? How to keep therapists? How to grow a practice? Uh, but it, it it's not typically binary, and I think that maybe is something that caught your eye for that practice owner who maybe needs things or wants things to be binary because I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I could, I could make assumptions on that. Like, I don't know, maybe that person needs things to be binary and, and they're posting and they're commenting about that uh, because maybe they don't have control of their practice or other aspects of their life. So the, the things that they're posting that you're seeing on Facebook, they're like, no, I, I need it to be this or that. I don't know. Maybe I'm making an assumption there, but uh, anyway. Yeah, I think we take this in layers. So like superficially, I think it's super important for us to understand ourselves. Personality wise, understand the people we're working with and understand our patients. I, I'm sure you're going to understand this story. So there are patients that are just always happy. I mean, no matter what, they get a flat tire on the way to the clinic. They're late for their appointment. Three other bad things happen and they come in full of sunshine and they're super happy. Um, you have to understand that is a different human than the patient who is always grumpy and, and they're happiest being grumpy. Like this is an important element. There are patients who are happy being unhappy, happy being grumpy, happy being mad. And I, as a therapist, if I'm the one treating those individuals, I have to recognize that. I have to accept that and I have to be comfortable with that. I know a lot of therapists that I've worked with, amazing therapists, they feel insecure if the therapy if the patient isn't happy but there are just patients who want to be angry who want to be unhappy and they feel best when they're in that role take that personality type and bring it into people working on your team i've had therapists their role their identity is wrapped around being grumpy and so i try to match personality with personality the personality of my client, what the client is looking for with the personality of the patient. There are clients who love to try and change somebody who is grumpy into somebody who is happy. I'll match those two because it's yin and yang. It's a great combination there. Um, it's okay to be however somebody wants to be as long as they recognize that this is what they need and this is what makes them feel better. And so talking about the therapist that I said, they're always going to be uncomfortable being a business owner because they're never going to have black and white. Um, if that once that person gets to the point where they acknowledge, okay, this is what it is. This is what therapy therapy business actually is. I'm okay with this. It doesn't mean I have to be happy. It just means I have to acknowledge that this is what it is. Then they're going to step into a new kind of stage in the development of a business owner. And, and it got me thinking because they've had multiple EMRs. They've had multiple, you know, I hired this accountant, I hired this marketing agency, and they keep firing all these people looking for the perfect solution that doesn't exist. And so at some point they just need to say, Hey, there is no perfect solution. I'm not going to be satisfied with any of the solutions that I buy, but they're all basically the same. So I'm just going to go with one and I'm going to be, you know, satisfied knowing that it's not going to live up to my standard, but this is the best I have available at the time. Because otherwise you you're stuck in this position where you're never actually moving the business forward. You, you just keep trying to reach this unattainable goal. That's never going to happen. So speaking about happy patients versus grumpy patients. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but for my clientele that we've seen over the past, let's say the past five years, you know, even through COVID before and after COVID, whatever. In general, someone that's going to spend 200 or more per visit they're typically on the happier side, which is amazing for us because then it's it's better for any of my therapists treating. Uh, they'll be more likely to stay with us because they they're happy. Here, here here's an example. Okay, here's a perfect example. I met up with a uh, physical therapist last week, Michael McClon. Uh, he I've known him for ten years. He was an aide when I first moved into Brooklyn, and then he went to DPT school. Okay. So, um, and maybe I shouldn't have said his name, but Michael, if you're watching, hopefully you're okay with this. So he were, I won't say that I won't say the company, but he works for a home health company 
and they do Medicare Part A. Now, I also heard this from another buddy who does also listen, Chris Nipol. I'll give Chris Nipol a shout out as well, who also used to work for me. Both of them either have or, or currently do work for a Medicare Part A home care company. And what they both have remarked to me, Tony, is that those patients, the therapists, they, they show up to the home, the apartment, and most of the time, they are not wanted. The patient says, why are you here? Go away. Um, and then they're like, the hospital sent me the, you know, the home care company, you know, like you're, you know, I got to fill out your oasis. I, I got to, I got to do all this paperwork. So they got to do extra paperwork to evaluate and treat a patient that does not want them there, which is, is kind of, I mean, almost could be a Netflix series. It could almost be a, a comedy show versus my clientele who pay out of pocket and are happier typically, not always, but typically they pay out of pocket. They want the therapist to come. They look forward to the visit. They are, I, and I told Michael last week when we met up, I said, imagine, I, and I was joking with, I said, imagine a practice. So you you're just complaining about these patients. They, you come, they don't even want you there. They're like, go away. I don't want you. I'm not, I'm not getting out of bed. I'm not doing anything. I'm not moving. You're not going to get me to do anything. And they're not paying anything out of pocket. And then our clientele are paying out of pocket, sometimes in the same functional status, sometimes in the same condition, they just came out of a hospital or, or, or whatever. Our clientele paying out of pocket. And then I joked, I said, yeah. And then you got less documentation, shorter notes. And I know all those things, but especially about the happy patient versus grumpy patient, the happy patient is attracted to our practice a little bit more versus, and again, cause we're not for everyone. And then because these other home care companies and these other therapy practices that are for everyone and they just accept every type of patient and every type of insurance, then of course you're gonna get some of the grumpy percentage of the population to kind of funnel into your practice. So you mentioned happy versus grumpy patients. And I had to mention that example. And I hate to feed into this stereotype, but I think you're going to, you know, people hearing that are going to say, well, of course, Dave's patients are happy because they're rich and the other patients aren't no, happy because no they're. But not, but no, not every, just because you live in New York City does not mean you're rich. And we've gone to homes where they are hoarders. They're on a monthly fixed income, whatever. And there's some people that just they want to pay out of pocket because they had they tried elsewhere. Not every patient is rich in New York City. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that was my point is like, happy people aren't happy because they're rich. They, there are plenty of less financially secure individuals that are still happy. We get patients with a Medicare replacement plan who have a $40 copay. And during our conversations, they'll talk about how, you know, this is hard to buy a $2.50 gallon of milk, but yet they'll happily pay a $40 copay, which is a huge part of their income because they value what we're delivering. They want that experience. They know that that's what they signed up for. Um, so, you know, to, to tie happiness to economics, I've just never seen that consistent, uh, relationship so, and, and you're right hundred percent, but I would also go back to saying, so the home health agency that knows they're going into those homes to treat patients who don't want therapy they should actively be seeking therapists who enjoy that, who want to see that challenge. I talk to therapists all the time. They're like, oh, I love changing the mind of my patients. I love patients who initially think they're going to hate therapy. And then I get in there and I start working with them and I win them over. There are a good number of therapists who are out there with that personality. I used to be a therapist like that. One of my greatest joys early in my career was knowing that I could make anybody love exercise, even patients that hated exercise, I can get them to love exercise because the way we did it, the experience we delivered, um, I think that's a huge value of a new grad or, or therapist who's younger in their career. I absolutely acknowledge that I am not the same therapist today that I was 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, but unfortunately, that's not the way the machine works. The machine of home health of Medicare Part A, even skilled nursing, it's let's just get a license and a pulse. Let's just get a license and a pulse. Like we just need cogs in a wheel to come in here. And I'm gonna even say that, like the personality of a human 
who loves doing the same thing, loves the predictability, loves knowing that they're going to go in, they're going to say, see the same patient by a different name. Um, they're comfortable in that environment. They, they've been happy in that environment for 30 years. They know when they clock out, they're not thinking about work. They, they, you know, they can shut off their brain and just go and enjoy their life. And they're getting paid a great salary and, and other things. Uh, the personality of the individual is just so powerful and so influential in all of these things. I think the better we can understand that, and you know, of course we talk about motivational interviewing, we talk about readiness for change. There, there's tons of science out there around these topics that I think we need to understand better than we do in most cases. It's not about how good of a therapist you are. It's about how well you understand the human in front of you, whether it be the employer, whether it be a coworker, or whether it be a, a customer, a patient that you're getting ready to see. If we have a couple minutes, I'd love to, to talk about Prasco Park and the baseball we went to over the weekend. Yes, yes, let's do it. So I, I we did research. Um, you guys watching, check out Prasco Park. Um, Prasco Laboratories is the parent company. And it, there's not a lot of articles out there. It's a privately held company. They're in pharmaceuticals. Um, they don't make any of the big brands that we would all know, but they make enough. Back in mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, I think they were doing $60 million in revenue. It's continued to grow since then. In 2008, they built a baseball park, and they are super involved in the community. So they have like... They offer free access to nearly professional baseball, or I'm sorry, basketball courts. The baseball park looks like a major league baseball park. It's smaller, but they have incredible seats, incredible natural grass turf. Um, they host the NCAA regional finals or something for baseball every year. And then they have other events. They host uh, concerts and things. Everything is free. It is the weirdest experience. So you you come to the park, you walk in, free admission. You, you go to the concessions, free hot dogs, free hamburgers, free drinks, free cookies. You look around, and, and I sent pictures on Facebook, like there's bounce houses for the kids. There's little games and stuff that they can play. Each night, they bring in a specific featured vendor. So here in, in Cincinnati, we have Montgomery Inn. They, they're a big barbecue house and they have, you know, really great ribs and pulled pork and all this stuff. So the first night it was free Montgomery Inn. Second night it was free La Rosa's, which is a local chain like Domino's Pizza, but local. And then they had free Chick-fil-A. Of course, everybody knows Chick-fil-A. So imagine going to a baseball park. You see college level baseball. These kids are incredible. You get free food, no alcohol, no smoking. It's, it, it is a religious organization or religion backed or, or associated. Um, but, you know, it, it's just this is the owner's way to say, hey, I want to give back to the community. I want to give back to the public. And it, it's just such an incredible experience. We've been doing it every year for the last couple of years. We try to tell all you know our friends. And it's so well hidden. Nobody knows about it. I talk to my, my friends and parents of kids that my kids go to school with. They're like, what is this? Where is it? Seriously? But it's amazing. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't understand why. I mean, typically, there's got to be some economic background. I know. Uh, let's Isn't see, that the uh, sad part? Every single person is like, what's the catch? What are they trying to do? Like there is put the, put literally, the, there's the literally the no team. advantage because they're not trying to recruit local workers. They have a very small staff. I think the last time I looked, they had like 70 employees. They, they have two locations, one here and one in another state. Um, there's just no, no advantage. And, and it's not like it's Pfizer and you're going to hear about them. It is just such a small, yeah. Jimmy's on. He said, you know, remarkability. Seth Godin talks about being remarkable. Um, I genuinely think this is just a good human who has more money than he needs and wants to bring family and kind of traditional values back to the community. And there's nothing more traditional than like taking the kids, going to a baseball game, watching baseball. What were you saying? I cut you off. Yeah, no, no problem. So, yeah. So Jimmy McKay said, the stadium is public relations in tangible form. And then he said, 
they've created an experience that people remember and tell others about that is creating remarkability. And so I, I agree. So last week when, or a week or two ago, when you mentioned this in, uh, in the messaging, uh, private messages, like I, it, I'm like, well, there's gotta be something like they're, they're trying to do advertising. They're trying to do branding, whatever. And you said like, no, no, because I guess the pharmaceuticals, they sell them under other names and other brands. So like people don't even know the the parent company. And like you said, it's not like Pfizer. So it's, it's like, is that truly it? Like, I just, I feel like most of the stadium, like I said, I, you know, Gillette stadium, you know, Gillette shaver for the Patriots, like, or any other stadium, uh, the Staples center, like all these, all these, uh, venues have, you know, big costs to, uh, brand the, the stadium or, or the field or whatever, uh, the stadium with your company's logo and, and likely, uh, likeliness and all that and the branding. So for them to do this and, and not have any economic return, I, I get, I guess, I mean, it's almost like it's almost like that. Can we say that it's almost like Chick Fil A, the owner that's also you know conservative, conservative Christian, whatever. Who I forget the guy's name. Where every Chick Fil A is closed on Sunday because of the Sabbath and you know all that. Um, but I mean, he's still a capitalist, and and they still you know have a product, and they've grown Chick Fil A crazy. So I guess I guess you can do both. I guess you can kind of have some. Uh, reasoning as to to do to do the thing but at the same time there there's some other capitalist components to it i just find it hard to believe like just to pop this up the stadium up and offer completely free food and free drinks free soda uh, soda pop whatever whatever you guys call it out there <laughs> or or free food i mean it's very generous it's, it's great for your local community i just look at it as like what like like when we, when we're on Facebook or Twitter, right. Or LinkedIn, like it's free. So we're the product, right. Yeah. So, you know, they're using our data to then sell us, sell advertisements against our data and our behavior and what we click on and how we scroll and our interests or whatever. So I just feel like I, I look at it and in, in that lens of like, what do they, what do they get out of it? What do they like? Uh, is it a tax write off? It, it's gotta be something. So, yeah, I mean, let, let's look at it through that lens and, and, the, you look at people like Bezos and Gates and all of these, you know, Warren Buffett who have committed pledge to give all their money away. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think most of us realize we can't take it with us. There, there's no other functional use for it. Um, when I look at even with many, like fewer zeros than this, but even in my physical therapy practice, there are plenty of examples where we do things knowing we're not going to get paid. I never tell the patient we're not going to get paid. I just do it because I want to do it, right? I just, I've already got the resources. I've already paid my staff. I've already paid my overhead, my utilities. Giving somebody something for free is not taking away from somebody else in these scenarios, but I don't need any kind of recognition. Like I have no idea who the owner of Prasco Park is, uh, the human. This there, this is, we always do things that make us feel good, whether it be doing something, you know, like taking a vacation or something like this. And, and at some point, once you reach a financial level of security, it's like, what the heck else am I going to do? You know? And if I give it to the government, I'm going to lose 30% of it to them. They're going to waste it on stuff that I probably don't agree with morally, ethically, or logically. So I'm like, the best thing for me to do is put this money back into the community you're creating hundreds of jobs. I mean, from the guys that are mowing the grass to changing the trash to serving the the people at the concession stands, you're giving, you know, college kids a chance to have a great experience. There, there's just so many more benefits to put that. I don't know. I'm, I'm completely making this up, but it's got to be hundreds of thousands of dollars a night back into the local community, the city of Mason, rather than giving it to politicians to buy more votes. Like, I, I do think that is an element in all of this. And I, and I know when I read the original article, one of the things was the owner's personal mission to give back to the community, you know, to help the community and, and distribute some of the wealth that he's accumulated. So I just think it's amazing. And I think as more people 
we've never seen the kind of financial success that we are seeing in this time period. Individuals that are making hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of dollars in small businesses that are one, two, three person operations. Um, to see them do things like this, I think we're going to see it become more popular and more commonplace because, you know, go ahead. That's my closing thought. Yes, we have seen this before. Andrew Carnegie at close to his death, all of a sudden wanted to spend all of his money and he put, uh, university libraries and I mean, like Princeton, I think there's like Carnegie, I mean, they're in New York City. There's Carnegie Hall. There's uh, Princeton has a Carnegie Library or a Carnegie Lake or whatever. I mean, there there is. Yes. What's the catch? There is a catch. G Jimmy, I think first, Jimmy's parting thought. What's the catch? He's showing a baseball. We're talking about a baseball park. I love the pun. I we miss you on the show, Jimmy. We miss you. We miss you, Jimmy. So here, I'll go. I'll I'll say this. Here's my parting shot. What's the catch for this? It's it's either what you just said of like giving back to the community, but like when, you, when, when people give, then they, they, they feel like they're receiving cause they're getting admiration, whatever. Maybe it's that, maybe it's some ego thing. Maybe something as simple as he's able to completely the owner, the true owner of the pharmaceutical company that does this or the pharmaceutical company themselves, they're able to completely break even on this. They spend millions of dollars to make this stadium. But then you also said the labor and the payroll and all that for all these jobs, but then maybe the local town, your local jurisdiction, whatever, has allowed them to, you know, not pay payroll taxes or whatever. They get some tax break or benefits or whatever. They could potentially, I'm, I'm, I'm just making a guess here, spend millions of dollars to pop this up, free food, free food for the community. It, it is goodwill for the community. And like you said, dozens, if not hundreds of jobs for people that do security and maintenance and all the stuff for the stadium and the food servers and all that, everything. Uh, maybe they break even on it. They, they completely break even on it. They get tax breaks because of these extra jobs that they're providing and the extra infrastructure in the community, the extra goodwill that you sometimes you, it's hard to put a price tag on maybe the pharmaceutical company breaks even. So whatever the millions of dollars that they invest in spending and the, and the money that they're putting into the labor and the usual taxes on the payroll taxes and the property tax for the stadium where it sits and, and all of that, maybe they get some breaks because otherwise, if it's not the ego and it's not the, the, the breaks with the tax incentives, I don't know. I don't know. But like you said, may, maybe you've got so much money, it doesn't matter. I don't know. I think there are still a lot of good humans out there that just want to do good things. So let's end it on that, guys. Come Thursday, 8.30 a.m., join Dave and I. Uh, we'll have a new batch of topics, and we'll see you then. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.